Fishing Intelligence, a fishing improvement podcast for the modern angler. Welcome back to another episode of Fishing Intelligence. I'm your host, Jacob Jasonic. On this week's episode of Fishing Intelligence, we're going to be talking with Steve Moore. Steve is a columnist for the Southern Trout Magazine, as well as the creator and owner of the Kayak Hacks Fishing YouTube channel, which focuses on gear hacks, fly, and spin fishing tips. Steve's a graduate of the United States Military Academy and now resides in Wilmington, where he normally targets redfish out of his kayak. Steve, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Hey, glad to be here. So we fished North Carolina when I came through on the angler tour. We did some kayak fishing. We filmed more of a lighthearted video. The whole tour had been focused on um, just down and dirty, you know, um, getting as many fish as possible. And we took more of a fun approach, a more, uh, more comical approach. And that was something that I really, really enjoyed while being on the tour. And I was just curious, how's the red fishing been since then? Because when I was there, there were no red fish to be found. Um, so have you, have you been able to get back on the red fish game? Well, th- that's why we had to do the comical piece because, Unfortunately, I could not take you to any of my top secret spots, so we went to the, the public spots. I was thrilled that you caught that huge stingray there, but we needed the comic relief to uh, alleviate the fact that we were probably going to get skunked. But in the places that I have access to via private property, the red fishing has been great all summer. The key is you have to understand what the tide is in terms of the launch and the migration of the redfish, in my case, from the intercoastal back onto the flats as they chase the mullet and the fidder crabs. And once you've solved that calculus to inflict some PTSD on math on you, (laughs) then, you know, every, every day is a pretty good day. But now one of the interesting things that my buddy and I have discovered is that, and, and I welcome feedback from any listeners on this, is that it seems like you never have two good days in a row. We'll go out and we'll just nail them. We'll catch eight or nine redfish each in the 22 to 27 inch range, go back the next day, same place, same tide level, and be totally skunked. And our theory is that the redfish come in in gangs. You know, they're just schools of them that hang out together. They come in, they feed, and then they go disappear, and they don't come back until they're hungry again. So that's just one of the mysteries he and I are continuing to try and unravel. So you're saying it's it's difficult to pattern these redfish, because even when you match up the tides, the weather, two days in a row could fish completely differently? Oh, exactly. But, you know, the, the key to uh, finding them is to catch one. You know, uh, both of us were were new to the Wilmington, North Carolina area and had no idea on where to go, couldn't afford to hire a guide to take us. And I always kind of felt that it's kind of bad to hire a guide and then go back to where the guide takes you to fish anyway. But once you find a redfish someplace, you have now nailed a prospective location. And it's important to understand, well, what was the tide level? What was the wind direction? What was the sun situation? Was it cloudy? Was it rainy? And all that kind of stuff. And that's where, just to jump off on the Angler app, that's where that has been a a great help to us because we can pump all that stuff in there and start to understand why that redfish was there because they're never just one. There, There are always a couple of them hanging around. And so if you can go back to that same place and then spread out from there, uh, you know, 100 yards up, 100 yards down, then you're going to start getting into the fish. And that's how we found all of our good spots. The lucky first catch and then the science. And, of course, given my buddy, he's an intuitive fisherman, uh, uh, putting his ESP to work got us onto these fish. And now we have 
a couple really great spots. And finding that first fish is such a confidence booster too, because there's really so much confidence involved in fishing. So when you're going out, you're getting skunked that it doesn't feel good. You, the mojo's bad and you probably catch less fish, I'm sure. But once you catch that first one, you're feeling more confident. You're feeling like you have an idea of where the fish are. You start laying into a few more fish. And before you know it, you have yourself a spot that you're going to be coming back to. Yeah. And, and this is a key difference, I think, between inshore, brackish water, marsh kind of fishing that that I do in my freshwater days on lakes and rivers is that on a, on a lake or a river, you know, that small mouth or that that trout or that large mouth, he's going to hang around that same blowdown and that's where he's going to live. Maybe he'll migrate to deep water, you know, with the weather, the summer, things like that. But with these uh, inshore fish, they're always running around, it seems. You know, they don't, given that the tide changes the water level, they can't just hang around in one spot. And they come in and out. And that's where he and I have become what we call ambush fishers. We know now that the fish are going to be running down a particular shoreline between a couple oyster beds uh, or some other choke point. And we'll get out there ahead of time based on the tide table and then just sit and wait. And we'll, we'll throw it, and we basically just use live bait, throw it out there, you know, tweak it around a little bit, and just wait for the fish to come and fall victim to it. And the ties are so fascinating to me as a, as a freshwater angler. I've, until the angler tour, I really had no prior serious experience with tides. Like, I've fished in Kiowa Island and South Carolina a little bit, done some fishing on the river there. Um, so, that like, that's a tidal situation where I noticed hey, as the tide moves, fishing gets better, different fish come with different tides, but it's really goes so deep with the tides. Like that is the main key for finding fish in saltwater. And do you see that um, with species other than redfish or are you mainly just focused on the redfish? Well, we're focused on the redfish because that seems to be what we can catch. But uh, apparently all brackish water fish, inshore fish, you know, operate off the same uh, ethic, so to speak. And in fact, you know, I, I used to go to the fishermen post schools uh, here in Wilmington. It'd be an all-day seminar where they'd have all the, the good guides come in and present classes on how we could catch more fish. And I remember talking to one after one of the seminars and asking him whether he was upset that people would follow him and watch where he was fishing. And he just kind of looked at me and laughed and he says, no, no, because they don't understand the key thing, which is the tide. You know, the guide knows that at the tide level of 2.1, he needs to be at spot A. And when the tide gets to 2.5, he needs to move away to the next spot where the fish are going to go. But the casual observer who doesn't understand the mathematics and the dynamics of tide will say, oh, that must be a good spot. And he may show up there at tide level of five or four and get totally skunked and just scratch his head. You know, it's great for the guides because, you know, that's what makes them their money. They know where the fish are going to be at the different tide levels. And that's why it's, it's usually a worthwhile investment if you're new to an area. But uh, he was just laughing when he told me that. And I remembered that. And every trip I take now, I, I add a note to every fish catch in the Angler app that, okay, it was tide level XYZ on this gauge and this time. And that way I can develop my log and understand where and when to be places. Okay, so you're actually tying the tides into the Angler app as of this moment, because right now we don't quite have tide charts in the app. That's something that's up and coming that we want to get out as soon as possible, but we have a million things going on. So you, right now your get around for that is you're literally just adding notes of where the tide's at for each fish. That, that's right. I use an app called uh, Tidegraph Pro and the pro version, I'm not, I think the pro version allows you to uh, store multiple tide tables and you can flip between them with a with a swipe, and I'll have my angler app open, I hit the bullseye, catch a fish, uh, record the length, I never bothered with the weight, 
and then I'll quickly open Tide Graph Pro and see what the tide level was at that instant when I caught the fish and add that as a note in the Angler app. Very so, cool. it's a, it's a way to build that logbook that we were missing for the first couple of years we were here. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great idea for anyone listening out there who's in the saltwater deal or for people who have been messaging us to get the tide charts up as soon as possible. There's the, there's the workaround for the, for the time being. Um, so you said that you normally are fishing for these redfish using live bait, which I'm assuming is spin fishing gear. Do you also do any fly fishing? You know, I, when I, I look at spin versus fly fishing, and given that I came to it late in life, it's kind of strange that I ignored it for so many years. But I love fly fishing much more than spin fishing. But the problem inshore, and I'll go back to uh, one of the guides I know, uh, Captain Luke Tippett, very interesting name. That's his real name, Tippett. <laughs> That's hilarious. Is he a fly yeah, guide? He's a, he, he is a fly fishing guide here in North Carolina. And what he told me is that unless you know where the fish are going to be on the flats and can see them tailing, uh, just blind casting with a big clouser or, or bait fish pattern or something like that is basically just a lot of exercise and a waste for time. So what he does with his fly fishing clients is he starts with spin gear. And once they get on the fish and understand that they're going to be in a particular spot uh, long enough, they quickly switch to fly gear and then go after them with the, uh, the fly rod. But I, I bas- basically am too lazy to carry uh, both sets of gear. And so I devolved to uh, taking my cast net out, catching some mullet, and then just using that all day. <laughs> I do agree though that fly fishing is a it's a whole new like whole nother world. Once I got into that, it was just something I became obsessed with instantly cuz I'll do it up here in Cleveland for steelhead and that's just Oh, yes. Yeah, that's an insane fight on a fly rod. You you basically have very little drag on these reels. They're peel in line, they're jumping, going through trees, branches, and you have this 10 foot, nine foot rod that you have to keep out of the way of trees and such. And it's, it's a whole nother world, especially when you get into the fly tying aspect, which I got into when I went out and worked in Yellowstone. It's a really personable way to fish, I would say. Yeah, I understand that when you're steelhead fishing, I've never done that, but you can hear the fly rods snapping and breaking all up and down the river. I haven't sna- I haven't heard or snapped a fly rod on a steelhead, but later on the tour, when I went down to a, uh, or before I got to you on the tour, I actually snapped my Orvis Clearwater on a peacock bass, and it's a very loud snap when it happens. So <laughs> yeah, pa- very painful snap too. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, had to had to pay the replacement fee on that one, and. The videos in there so it's at least we got it on video that's what that's all that matters i remember that one you know i, I came to fly fishing late in life it wasn't probably till 2007 that uh or maybe yeah 2007 that i picked up my first fly rod and what prompted me to do that was i, I went my brother came up to visit and he w- had his fly rod and he was going to go fly fishing for the first time so we both go up and we were on Town Creek in Maryland. It was the fall and my spin gear was catching a, a thousand leaves. Mm-hmm. And he was floating, you know, top water dry flies and having a great time of it. And I looked at that and I looked at my gear and I say, clearly a hammer isn't the solution to every carpentry problem. I need to broaden my exposure. So that that uh, winter, I bought a $25 Walmart fly kit of a Fluger, I guess I say it, Fluger rod reel and some level line and played with that and kind of got into it. And once I caught my first fish on that, I realized how bad that equipment was and got <laughs> a fly fishing buddy to come with me to Bass Pro Shops to get some good stuff, but I never turned back. And on freshwater, I am exclusive fly fishing on uh, streams and rivers, and I'll use my spin gear for bass on lakes because it's just 
hard to be a fly guy on a lake. You know, the the soft plastics, the top waters and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it, it just, you know, nothing beats it when you're going after a largemouth. So you've done a lot of freshwater fishing. What's the transition like from freshwater to the brackish saltwater fishing that you do now out in, uh, out in Wilmington? Well, the first thing, of course, is the environment. When you, you look at, you know, walking up the Rose River and the Blue Ridge Mountains or, you know, fishing the, the Rappahannock at the junction of the Rappahannock and the Rapidan, the terrain is, is kind of the same. You, you have rocks and pools and uh, trees on the side that uh, provide shelter, and you kind of know where the fish are going to be after a bit. But you put in, get in a boat and you go out on inshore. I, I never go in the ocean. I'm an Army guy. I get seasick. <laughs> but you go out on these these big bays and you look around and it's it's like a, a watery desert. Everything looks looks exactly the same. You see uh, spiky spartina grass all over the place and you're 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 looking and the tide's going and the wind's moving and you're wondering, well, where the heck do I throw my my first bait? And that's the, the first thing you have to learn. And the best of way, of course, is to go out with a guide and get them to teach you. And in fact, that's exactly what I did. I hooked up with my friend Chris Tryon at the Hook, Line, and Paddle Fly Shop here in Wilmington, and I booked him for a, a, a guided kayak fishing trip with the express intent of, hey, teach me what to look for and, and how to fish. And we had a great time. It was an all-day trip, and, and I took notes and took everything he told me to heart. And the, the key thing when you're ambush fishing like, like we are is you have to understand what the migration pattern is of the redfish in particular, although the flounder and sea trout do the same thing, from wherever they are at low tide to high tide. And the redfish in particular will follow the bait in, they'll follow the mullet in, and the oyster beds and the deep channels and the grass lines will all make them go in a very specific way. But then once they break through that initial oyster bed, you know, channel barrier and they spread out onto the flat, then they're back there in the Spartina grass. And what you have to look for is where are they going to set up an ambush point? And if you go down a, a uh, grass line, and it's totally boring. There's nothing there except a straight grass line. There's not going to be any fish there. You got to look for the small points, the small indents, where the trout and the redfish and the flounder can all kind of hang out and wait for the mullet to come swimming by, and then they jump out and grab them. Now, the trout are a little bit unique in that they like to be in about five feet of water. Uh, my experience with the redfish is that we can catch them in a foot of water. They have no uh, qualms about coming in shallow. But then they all disappear at high tide. And you can hear it, and it's, it's really frustrating. You can be on the grass line at high tide, and you'll hear all this snapping and flapping and splashing you know, back there about 20, 30 feet into the tall grass where the redfish have pursued the mullet deep in there and they're just snapping and eating away and there's no way you can throw anything to them without getting hung up. But wow. that's, that's the key thing. The other thing of course is how you uh, get to them, you know, what kind of boat you use. And then the good news is on, on your rod and reel. Now I was a canoe guy for a thousand years. My dad, you know, introduced the canoe. And in fact, I remember him, uh, sculling us in an old aluminum beat up canoe that we had for years with a paddle that he had carved out of a, a I think a, a two by a one by six when he was a kid. That was a sculling paddle and we'd move around in that thing. So, you know, I brought my canoe down here thinking, yeah, yeah that's a good, good idea. No, no, the canoe's too high profile. You just get blown away with the mm -hmm. wind on some of these big bays. So I didn't want to spend all the money on a, a real boat. So that's when I went and got the kayak. 
And I tell you, I just love kayak fishing. It's a great way to get exercise. It keeps you low to the water and you can move back where a lot of those power boats can't go. Now, in terms of rods and reels, I've discovered that there's really no, no real issue. There's no barrier. You can use anything you would use for bass inshore. I've caught 26 inch redfish on medium light rods with, you know, 20 pound uh, mono, uh, braided nine. It's really not an issue. It's just a matter of working the drag and getting it set. The only issue on rods and reels is that if you start throwing live bait, that gets up a little bit in weight and you may want to move up to medium heavy or heavy so you're not running the risk of breaking your rod when you fling it. Now, the, the other thing, of course, is terminal tackle. You know, I, I can go out to my garage and pull out all my bass stuff and I've, I've got all those soft baits. I've got, you know, the power bait. I got the, the gulp. I've got just, uh, you know, the Yamamoto, you know, pencil Senkos and all Senko, that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah. And, and uh, you got the, all the different topwaters and crankbaits and things like that. And I don't think you need that much stuff when you're, uh, you're fishing here in shore. In fact, my buddy is a retired sergeant major out of the 82nd Airborne, and he would look at all the crap that I would bring with me on my kayak and just turn his nose up and that he would say, if you can't jump out of an airplane with it, you don't need it. <laughs> and, uh, and he would have just a, a little bag of his rigs and, and, and the live bait. And I've, over the years, I've moved more and more in his direction. You know, once you find out what works for the targeted species, you know, you don't need to go spend a bazillion dollars on the, the latest color MR17 or, or topwater lure. You know, stick with the one or two that work and you know, go for it. Now, the flip side of that is I remember when I was a boy, uh, a young man really, my, my dad uh, was in the military and he had some uh, non-commissioned officer buddies and one of them would go out fishing with me. And I remember the, the first time I went out with him, uh, it was at Camp Hunter Liggett in California. We pulled up and uh, we had a little John boat and he opened the trunk of his car, and in that trunk of the car was probably 5,000 different uh, wars. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he had, them, he had this thing built out to where the racks would come out. He could pull the trays out and, like the and things like pros. that. Yeah. And uh, I, I just looked at him and said, Sergeant Major, how, how do you figure out what, what you want to use? And, and he looks at me and says, that's the difference between a, being a good fisherman and a bad fisherman. And he gazed at his, his uh, inventory there and he picked out three or four things. Note, he only picked three or four things. We got in the boat and we caught fish. So he didn't take that whole trunk full of stuff with him. He knew that, okay, time of day, where we are, what the situation is. Yep, these three things will work just fine. That's what we're going to use. Mm-hmm. And something that resonated with me that you said is like the picking of as minimal baits as possible. Um, as I've fished saltwater more and more, the only lure that I'm really ever focusing on throwing in saltwater for for a variety of species is that saltwater assassin sea shad paddle tail. And yeah, I'll throw yeah, that. They work. Yeah, I'll throw that in like a mama's chicken or something along those lines, and that's been my absolute go-to saltwater bait I've caught. Um, all sorts of fish on that. It's all over my YouTube channel, the fish that I've caught on just that one bait, but I'll buy just five or six packs of those. Um, just a regular, regular hook, nothing special. And yeah, I'll use my bass gear and be able to catch redfish and trout and flounder on just this little paddle tail. So you can keep it super simple and still effectively fish without spending a million dollars on tackle. Yeah, and, and I think that's the key thing that in my, you know, late ancient age of being 66 that I've learned is that, you know, stick with what works. I think when I was younger, I would switch lures too often. And this goes to fly fishing as well. And if you keep switching, you never know whether it's your presentation or the war. Mm -hmm. And 
once you figure out, you know, what generally works, just stick with that and save yourself a bunch of money. You won't get in trouble with your wife as much then. <laughs> so you said you switch from the canoe to the kayak. How do you rig your kayak out to most effectively fish for redfish? Well, the, the first thing, of course, is you got to pick the right boat. Uh, and the, if you, you've never been in a kayak before, you know, everybody will, will tell you, oh, yeah, go demo a, a couple different models. Well, yeah, that, that kind of works. But until you've been in a boat for hours and hours and hours, you're not, re you're not really going to know what its pros and cons are. And in fact, you know, I, I just bought the Jackson Cusa FD uh, last December and fished with it all season here. And I'm going to put up a big video on my YouTube channel that really kind of gets down to what works on that thing and what doesn't. You know, a lot of people, once they buy a kayak, oh, everything's good on it. You know, there's nothing bad. So the first thing to do is to go buy a used boat a used kayak if you've never been in one before. Now, you can use the demos to figure out what used kayak you want to buy. But once you do that, uh, then you're in there for the for the cheap, and you can use that for a couple years and then figure out exactly how you want to rig it, what it's missing that you need in the next kayak to rig it, and things like that. Now, before you go out and buy anything for any kayak you buy, you need to you go out to YouTube and there's a lot of great channels out there like kayak DIY and others where guys talk about fun things you can make to rig out your kayak that cost a whole lot less than what you'd go spend in a store. For example, I think the Yak Attack Black Pack is really just nothing but a, a fancy milk crate, but you end up spending, I think, over a hundred bucks for it. Yeah. Where you could go to go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy the right kind of milk crate, one of the sturdy ones, for maybe 10 bucks. And then with a little bit of PVC, you can put as many rod holders on there as you want and things like that. You know, Harbor Freight or the dollar store are great sources of very inexpensive small tackle boxes. Because again, you know, they call them toolboxes for some reason. But again, if you don't, you don't need to take all that much stuff with you so you don't need the huge toolbox like if you look at some of my early videos on my first boat before the my fishing buddy, you know, grabbed me by the throat and said, you're bringing too much crap with you. Uh, you know, I had this huge toolbox in the back. I had a couple in the front and I had all this stuff that I never used. Now, there are a few things that you absolutely have to have on any kayak you, guy, you buy. And the first one is... If you're buying a fishing kayak, of course, it needs to be stable enough so you can stand up in it and fish standing up. So it needs to probably be at least 33 inches wide. And you need to install a stand-up assist rope, you know, basically just a rope attached <laughs> to your front carry strap, and uh, put some additional dropper loops in there where you can also use it as a flip line for recovery or a kayak reentry ladder ladder with the uh, PVC handle you'll put on it. Then you need something to hold your tackle. You know, a lot of guys like using milk crates. You know, I'm down to the very small, probably four by by 10 plastic toolbox you can get from the dollar store. Uh, you got to have your, and I, I think, I'm, yeah, I, I've got the butt pack on the front of my seat now that I've strapped there to have stuff immediately available to me, my fish grips and things like that. And then, of course, you need your safety gear. You got to have a PFD, your your whistle, and things like that. Your pump, and uh, if you're inshore, you need to have a VHF radio and a beacon. But once you've got a, a milk crate and you know something to hold the basic gear in, you don't really need that much more stuff. A fishing kayak is going to come with a couple rod holders in the back, and you can use those for the first couple trips to understand the dynamics of a rod holder, and then maybe go out and buy a Scotty mount or a Ram mount with the, the right size rod holder that'll keep the butt of your fishing rod, you know, from bumping on your legs or getting in the way when you spin things around. You don't need a net. Uh, I haven't used a net all season. I used to use one last year. Uh, the fish grips are just fine for redfish and flounder and, and trout. So, 
don't spend a lot of money until you need to spend some money. And then look for something that you can make yourself and have fun doing before you go out and uh, buy something in a store. That's that's an excellent point. Um, the boat that I started with, the kayak that I started with, was actually the Jackson Big Tuna, which obviously isn't a cheap option, but it was more of a family kayak. And that's the one that I fished with. Well, or not, I didn't fish out of the Jackson. I fished out of the Bonafide. So I've gotten to get the two perspectives of those. And I'd say that, you know, it's it's really, there's a lot of different variables for what you're going to like in your kayak. But after doing the whole tour, fishing a bunch of different places with both of those kayaks, I'd have to say that um, the pedal for the kayaks is absolutely a must if you're going to be either fighting tide all the time or fighting wind all the time or just really going to be out a lot because um, the ability to work hands free and stay in the keep your head in the current keep your direction the way you want it facing is just so critical for kayak fishing and that doesn't have to be your first boat you know but if you get a kayak that's cheaper and you really love the sport, then that's that's one of the best upgrades I could recommend for. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I should have said that as well. My my first kayak was a paddle kayak. Yep. And, you know, I kind of looked down my nose at these pedal guys, you know, you know, they're not getting the exercise that I, I'm getting. And it's not traditional. But the Jack that Jackson Coos FD I got is a, a pedal with three different speed settings that you can put on the prop. And I will never go back. Your range is increased. Your speed is increased. I can fish in more places now because I can get to them in a reasonable amount of time. So if your first boat, again, is used, you know, try and get a pedal one. I think it'll work out better for you. Well, that was an information-packed podcast. I appreciate you being on here so much. Where can people find your YouTube channel? It's Kayaks Hacks Fishing. So uh, just pop that in the search bar and I'll come right up. And you guys will be able to see some some of the funny outtakes from Steve and I's episode from the Angler Tour and also on Angler's page as well. But Steve, thank you for thank you for all that information you gave to the listeners. I'm sure that all the kayak guys will be taking this to heart and hopefully we'll get some new kayak fishermen out of this. There we go. Thanks for having me. Thank you guys again for listening to another week of the Fishing Intelligence Podcast. Make sure that you guys are subscribing on Spotify, Google Play, and iTunes, as well as leaving good reviews. I appreciate it, and as always, catch you next week. Fishing Intelligence, a fishing improvement podcast for the modern angler. 